Grind here, and when I went to the grand opening of also Viking Martial Arts in Egan, Minnesota, not only did I get to hang out with author Von Eschen, most generous host, and uh, Demacanter or Roland Varzeka, and even go out to eat at nice restaurants, but one of the greatest highlights of the entire trip was at the end. We actually went to Arms and Armor. And uh, I guess in the words of uh, author Von Eschen, uh, he would explain the rest. Kind of affiliated is, you know, Oakshot is the organization that collects the authentic weapons. So these are the actual mm -hmm. Viking Age weapons. And then Arms and Armor is really the reproduction arm. Uh-huh, okay. That's pretty cool to have that reference. So they reproduce the same weapons then? Oh yeah, that's super nice to have that. Here. So they have the actual weapons of reproducing. Now that is perfect. Craig is going to get us Moonbrand, that is uh, Hubert Oakshot, that was Hubert Oakshot's most favorite sword, and it happens to be a Type 14 sword from the period that I like most, where you do sword and buckler fighting, so I'm all excited. He's uh, going to take us to the place right now. This is the place to be. Now this is the real armory, huh? That's not old. That's just the other mess in that say hello. Oh yeah. I remember the first time I showed up here. It was just water and I'm thinking lost. All the pole pole axes and pole arms and spears. But here is the center of attraction. So this is way it is then? Uh no, we just we just had that in there just to you know, it's just sitting here to keep dust off it and stuff. Mm -hmm. So we, it's all locked up and stuff. And then, uh, you know, when we're transporting yeah. it anywhere else, it's the, uh, yeah, it's you know in a case or something like that. Roland's like, "Where's the shrine? Where's the shrine?" <laughs> <laughs> I expected to see one the way Roland was talking about it on the way here. So, and the rip is kind of fragile, so oh, we can't wow. grab it too. Can't swing it or anything. But this is uh, this is Moon Man. It's pretty cool. I'm Arthur. I'm Chris. Oh, I'm this dog at the Pony Show. So, <laughs> yeah. hey, this Chris, is I'm Roland. Roland, nice to meet you. Seen your videos. <laughs> oh, and this cool. is uh, Thrand, who uh, does some things on YouTube. Oh, pleased to meet. Hi, Thrand, on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> so this is Chris Poor, the owner of Arms and Armor and uh, head chief of the Oakshot Institute. I don't know yeah. what's your title. President Pleasure to meet you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, mostly check writer. Poncho. Can I lift Poncho. it up to feel oh, yeah, yeah. the weight? Yeah. Yeah. And you're saying this is the one where the handle is. It's a little, yeah, it's getting pretty, pretty. Uh, uh, it's one of the two we have in the collection that have their original either 13th or 15th century grips, wow. so we treat them carefully. Yeah, or it might be a 14th century regrip, but fundamentally it's. Yeah, so this is something that is a rarity. You very rarely see anything like yeah. that. Um, well, we can open it up. We've got the, uh, the uh, Airbrock, which is a sort of a 1450s, 1460s longsword with the original grip. And that's in the case. So that's a little that layer of uh, leather on top, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. So here uh, on the side of it, so, so uh, what we see here is um, like um, uh, uh, um, a layer here of, uh, of wood, uh, a layer of wood here, and then there's like um, another layer. Yeah? That very possibly could have been the way it was constructed. Grips, um, grips on the swords can be done in three or four different ways. And, uh, you know, because there appears to be a ridge on either side mm -hmm. here. You often you just take a left and a right and carve it out, but you know, mm -hmm. is it the original grip? Is it a field repair? But almost certainly, they, you know, they peen the pommel down and then put the grips on afterwards. So, and so the, these fine lines here—that's the grain of the wood, or oh, you're saying well, that's probably the shaping the tool yeah. they use to oh, oh, I see. make the grip shape. I see. Grip shape. I see. Okay. Grips so. are, I mean, in the working life of a sword, you'd have ten or twenty grips on it. I mean, a wooden grip lasts a few years and then it's replaced. And certainly the leather is replaced what? far more frequently than that. So what process do you go through for that? Because that's where I've actually completely pulled apart my swords before. And you can. Well, you, you take two pieces. You carve it out to fit the tang. 
you assemble them. And some of the old ones you find pitch. Oh, okay. So they're pitching them on. Oh, interesting. Um, a lot of times you'll find wooden shims banged in on the top of the cross guards, and that's on the yeah. I find the yeah, yeah. Um, I find the uh, shape of the uh, of the cross guard really interesting. There, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. that um, you have this taper. You have this taper here. I can hold it for you if you want. Uh, that's, okay. that's fine. It's more likely to drop when two try to hold. Yeah. Oh yeah. I always love to point out how uh, even on a good sword there and then it's and then it swells up a little bit know, to uh, the actual uh, symmetry is towards the end. Century thing. Yeah, this this the arm of the guard. This arm is longer than that arm. Mm -hmm. Well, that's quite typical that uh, they're asymmetrical. Well, this was the measure. I mean, it's you know your yeah. I mean, everything was yeah. a rule of thumb. Yeah. Hey. And then you have these uh, distinct um, uh, tiny fullers mm -hmm. here. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, and there's some there's some stamps on the other side. I was just about to ask if there's any yeah. sta any marks. Yeah, there you go. Oh yeah, and those a few ones. Few little mm -hmm. little indications here that are probably either kind of an X in solid dot or some kind of shape and then dot on each side. You can see it. Yeah, that's not just part of oh, the yeah, first. Yeah. I was thinking it was just part of the pitting in it, but it's not. Nope. No, and, it is something. Yeah, and you see, and it, again here, like I was talking on the other swords, you can see some of the structure of the metal is responsible for some of these things where probably some kind of silicate exclusion in there has created a weakness, and at some point part of it has popped up off of there. Um, like some of where, it could be where are you saying? corrosion well, going the, in. Those, those deeper pits. Yeah, like a deep pit like this here. You see how the, the down below in the base of it, it almost looks kind of like a rotted wood appearance. Right. A lot of times what that's from is the, the silicates when the metal is forged out and they get drawn out in these long strings or thin layers. Uh, over time, those silicates can either... Uh, you know, basically crush away, or I you know, they'll, they'll cause a shunt or something. And if you get some moisture in there, then you can get corrosion occurring inside. And what that corrosion oh. does is expands, and then it can pop out a flake if it's in there weakly. Um, you know, you'll get a, pi a flake pop out. So then sometimes you will get, you know, these things. Whoops, sorry. I'm just, yeah, it's I'm right. Just, it's just just north of. Uh, the uh, the marks like an inch or so maybe. That's interesting. I never Very thought well about done. that whole moisture thing because a lot of the bloomery iron I've worked with, when it has sort of the kind of cracking, you're not exactly sure where it goes. Good for cuts. Yeah, but I could see moisture. Really, really point off mm -hmm. the thrust, correct? Especially it's if it's that far or a the hill or something, you know. Yeah. Uh, sometimes when you'll find a sword that's you know in mud, you know, in a river, there'll be a portion of the sword that's just gone. Right, but it'll look like somebody came and took a bite out of it. And for whatever reason, when it was down in that anaerobic mud, at one point some of it got exposed, and the corrosion just, you know, just ate through and yeah. took it completely. Mm. So. Mm. so this one uh, has a peening block. I've never seen a peening block with uh, uh, this kind of uh, rounded uh, edges. It's kind of a unique thing, and it also sits down in a depression in the top. Oh of yeah, the yeah, column, right, right. Which is very yeah. Uncommon, I believe. Yeah. Could I, that have I've been from too many. the size of the peen of, and also the it's softness a, of the pommel? Um, softness of the pommel, they're probably not too worried about. Um, no, I'm just saying as far as like how it happened. Like maybe well, it's certainly, had, uh, what it does though is it locks it. So yeah. uh, like uh, with one of my swords, which has this peening block, you can move it a little bit. Mm -hmm. yeah? Yeah. Uh, so with this recess of the peening block. Um, that yeah, it's just this, another mechanical. Yeah. Yeah, there's a really interesting theory about the um, peening blocks. You probably know it, but I'm going to say it anywhere for our viewers. Um, that because, uh, as Chris said, you have to remount the sword in its life a couple of times uh, in order to get to uh, the handle. So oftentimes, when you um, would put on a new handle, then um, with many swords you would have uh, uh, openings in the cross guard or maybe not with this one or maybe even in the in the pommel and then uh, you make like a, a one-piece handle that is put onto the tank and um, that means opening um, 
or uh, um, uh, taking off the hand, uh, taking off the pommel always means that you lose part of the tang because you have to uh, file off um, the part that actually keeps the sword together. And then when you remount it and you pin it again, of course the tang gets shorter each time. Now if you have a pinning block, um, you have like. A, additional length of tang and uh, if you just uh, file down the pinning block a little bit uh, that's um, what uh, is like a warranty you can do that multiple times as opposed to pinning it um, right on top of the pommel. Right? Yep. Like a lot of modern swords you get don't have anything like that so if you had to redo it it keeps getting shorter and shorter. Exactly. So exactly. I wonder if some Viking Age swords might have had slightly longer handles until they had to shorten them to mm, repair them. I, I doubt Some it of them, because that's what the I way the Viking sword is assembled is a little different. So you probably would have a more um, uh, stable situation with that. And if, with Viking grips... That's what I mean. I wonder if some of the grips well, could have gotten shorter from the original grip. Because you know, they would less, just shorten the grip to accommodate. Right, but we have less information about how a Viking grip would have been applied than we do like on these kind of swords. So because this one has most, to stay a certain size to well, be used correctly. Well, most organic Viking grips are gone. Mm -hmm. You know, we have the metal ones, we have the metal fittings, but the organic materials, the wood, the leather, if they were done in leather, you know, are gone. Uh, we do have ones in bone horn. We have yeah. ones in, you know, with all sorts of metal ac uh, accruements on them, but accoutrements on them, but, um, because you have those two structures like this, you would you might be doing that kind of sandwich grip and not necessarily trying to take it off. They might have thought that was a mm. dumb way to do it. Mm. Um, and then also, you know, with, with any of these things, there's no one way, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. There's multiple answers mm. to the question. So if you start getting into Viking swords, you got other things that are going on, you know, a lot of use of organic materials in the guard and pommel a lot of use of mastics, you know. Uh, I've seen a Viking uh, guard that literally will slide down the blade. The hole is large enough to just slide up and down the blade. Whoa. Uh -huh. So it, when it was in place, it was, it's got a recess and it was just probably filled with glue to hold it in place. I've also thought they used glue a lot. I mean, yeah, so, but glue works solution. great inside a hammer. Yeah, but if I go on you can't replace it easily if you need well, to replace it. No, yeah. but it, and if I go and put it, you know, this guard is glued on on my website, I'm not going to sell that sword. Like there's not the, modern. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like oftentimes when you uh, look at tall wars are glued on at I the bottom that. side. Of, mm -hmm. A lot of tall war handles are just glued right on. Of cross guards, um, yeah. if you have uh, the cross guards are often loose, and then um, the opening. Um, for the blade is actually much wider mm -hmm. than um, would be required, and um, so I'm just that trying one's to quite figure tight, out. isn't it? Yeah, it no. seems to be, but it, doesn't it seem to be the uh, the case with this on too? And it's filled with some kind of uh, raisin-like yeah. looking stuff. It's like it's, particular this part here. Yeah. yeah, it's probably you know well. It, what is what is often in these recesses are um, hundreds and hundreds of years of Dirt, coatings, wax, goo, oil. Mm, I see. It just builds up in there so they look tight. Mm -hmm. But when you clean them out or you see ones that don't mm. have any of that material I there, see. they're loose. And you can see here, if you look very closely, the shoulders of this sword don't actually quite touch the guard. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's so uh, it, this kind of guard is often not seated inside a little insert but it's a groove that's been either swaged or filed uh, by hand so that the sword just kind of sits there right on top of the guard mm -hmm. it doesn't go down into the uh -huh. guard itself uh -huh. okay you see that quite often but Today we, the modern is, community wants their swords yeah. in there. Yeah. I was just about to say, if you do a job like that on a, uh, on a modern sword, then uh, you might have customers uh, complaining on that, uh, saying, I, oh, people would have pictures all over the internet. Look yeah, at how horrible look at this, this crappy was. job. Like, uh, <laughs> and are you saying that Quillian's not totally symmetrical? They're not symmetrical? No, 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 no. That, that's well, terrible. it doesn't matter. They're the sword still functions, and there's more yeah. than enough there to, to serve yeah. its purpose. So they would have thought it was fine, and it was a lot of work just to make it. Mm -hmm. They said everybody used, what, finger measurements, correct? Thumbs and, uh, and, and well, inches. Well, not everyone. I mean, the, 
When you think about craft in the context of how they were creating these things, you can't think of the way uh, a modern person approaches something with a ruler and a blueprint and is set down to, okay, okay I need 11 sixteenths right here and that. You're going to use things that are more like proportions. So you get, a, you know, what do, what do these people have for layout tools? They have a straight edge. They have a compass. Yeah, compass uh, is the most important. Yeah, they I might guess. have a right angle, but you don't necessarily need a right angle if you've got a compass. And you know, and the other thing is, if uh, if you're uh, an expert craftsman, like a friend of mine, um, he's a carpenter. He said um, his master, when he uh, was an apprentice, he could uh, pick a saw and there's a huge beam, and he would just uh, by hand. Yep. I saw it down at a perfect right angle along the whole uh, cutting plane. It was just perfect, just because of routine and expertise mm -hmm. gained in, uh, in decades of uh, doing that craft. Confidence of doing it right. Right. Yeah, you, you, yeah. you step to and you do it, yeah. and you don't think about not doing it right. Mm. Oh yeah, that's a big part of it. Yeah. Plus, um, your body is conditioned, it's just ingrained in mm -hmm. your, uh, yeah. uh, in, in, you exactly know what you're yeah. doing. Yeah, you get, uh, any tool you use that often becomes that way. Uh, when we're planishing armor or something, you know, you're doing multiple hits in very specific spots, but you get to a point where you can look away and keep planishing and look down and you haven't nicked it, mm -hmm. you know. And yeah. you're working by the, you're working off the feeling of the tool exactly. and the material. It's like a friend of mine who is an illustrator too, but uh, his expertise is with uh, doing uh, like at least a 50 frames for a storyboard per day. Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, you know, the other day a really strange thing happens to me. Happened to me. Um, I watched my hand, my hand doing the job. <laughs> so he felt like uh, um, he was like um, in a different zone of uh, awareness. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. That, uh, People can relate to that when we talk about skills like this or talk about crafts. And then when they think about uh, martial arts, suddenly uh, they deny those uh, fighters from uh, the European Middle Ages or from whichever period and region this skill at uh, uh, activity which uh, is um, made for life and death situations. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Would work the same way. Yeah. And the time the time on target for the craft or the art of fighting, mm -hmm. where to achieve those kind of levels of interaction with materials like that as tools, it can't be an hour or two exactly. practice a week. Exactly, yeah. exactly. You look, at, uh, you look at any uh, modern sports, I mean, uh, if you look at professional sportsmen, how picky they are about their shoes and how uh, uh, the industry starts to develop uh, uh, new shoes or whatever, or, uh, um, I don't know, surfboards, mm -hmm. you name it, right? Yeah. So, so the artifacts uh, are a reflection of um, the particular uh, use they were intended for. Exactly. And in, in, in this one, I mean, you, if you want to ruin these edges and ruin this blade, that's an easy job, mm -hmm. right? I mean, uh, even after all these years, they're still very delicate and um, actually they're pretty sharp. I think very sharp. I think it's pretty much the sharpest uh, original I've ever had. What's the weight of this blade, do you know? Ah, uh, uh, shoot. Uh, Two point two, maybe. I have all the specs in the office. I got a you spec do? sheet. I'd be really interested in that. Yeah. Would you mind me doing a, a, a tracing of that on paper? No, no. That would be super cool. And I want to actually get to hold it in a second too. <laughs> oh yeah, I can. Should I film me holding it? Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs>